Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Many fields, and, uh, and now I'm going to talk about um, something that uh, Jim um, had mentioned this morning, um, is that in, in a field of science, you typically interact with many disciplines. Um, so, so today I represent the uh, bioinstrumentation lab at MIT, uh, where we basically combine um, many disciplines, such as biology, optics, uh, mechanics, mathematics, uh, electronics, and chemistry. Um, and, um, and mostly these uh, um, uh, disciplines are combined to create new, uh, molecular, uh, new um, medical devices uh, and instrumentation. So over the years, uh, we've built several instruments at various uh, scales, uh, from needle-free uh, drug delivery systems, for example, uh, down to um, scanning cutting electron microscopes or uh, robots that can have a sub-nanometer uh, resolution. And so it struck us that um, each time we build an instrument, uh, we need to deal with, uh, well, how do we um, um, interact with our, our fellow colleagues and transmit uh, our results? Um, and also, how do we record these results in the first place? So my talk today will, will discuss uh, an initiative we have uh, to um, uh, create wireless sensors to measure about anything you can think of uh, in science. And uh, right now, we have about 54 sensors uh, we have identified. And I'll talk also about um, an experiment we've conducted to use um, tablet PCs uh, as a replacement for uh, laboratory notebooks. Um, the lab is uh, headed by uh, Ian Hunter, and we have about 30 people uh, working full-time. Uh, over the year, we've uh, either spun out companies or have had our technology uh, being adopted by uh, leading companies as well. Um, what, what sets us apart a little bit um, is that we are uh, very fortunate uh, to have assembled over the years uh, multi-million dollars uh, production faci facilities uh, where we can make uh, about anything. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, here, uh, five axis milling centers, EDMs, and so on. Uh, so again, uh, these machines also have, uh, are digitally controlled and therefore also need to be on a network of some kind. Uh, here are some of the examples of the instruments we've developed over the years. Uh, here, for example, is, is uh, a needle-free uh, injection device, uh, um, a high throughput fiber testing, uh, mostly used actually to test human hair, uh, in a high throughput manner. Uh, we've also worked with DNA uh, spectrometers, uh, where, we, where you'd like to identify a mutation in DNA uh, very quickly, uh, and thus you need to run uh, 10,000 capillaries at the same time to find uh, mutations along your, your genetic code. We've, we've also worked with um, uh, unusual materials uh, that can contract and expand and, and, and done some work in that. Again, a totally different area of science. We've also, as I discussed, uh, created uh, sub um, uh, uh, nano robots with sub picometer, uh, sub nanometer uh, resolution. Uh, here's one uh, implementation of that. And from all this work, we realized that there's actually no framework um, that allows you to capture um, data uh, in a concise and, and integrated manner. And so, based on that, we created um, this project in collaboration with Microsoft. Um, you may well know that MIT has an alliance with Microsoft called iCampus, uh, where a faculty can uh, come forward and propose projects uh, related to e-science and education at the same time. And so we launched IDAT uh, about nine months ago uh, as a project to, um, um, on one hand, give scientists a suite of sensors uh, that are wireless, but also use these sensors to teach uh, university students or perhaps high school students uh, how science uh, works. And um, if you compute the numbers, um, this can be, we're talking about a very large amount of sensors that pot potentially can be uh, disseminated. So we'll start with university and then go to high school, middle school, and so on. For example, um, the U.S. has about 400,000 engineers that are being uh, produced, if I may say so, every year. Um, if you equip each of these with 50 sensors, it's 20 million sensors. Or if you have, let's say, a smaller a penetration, you still talk very high, uh, very high numbers. And so because of that, because there's going to be 50 sensors, because there's going to be so many sensors also uh, being deployed, low cost 
and usability is actually very key for the success of the project. Um, what are existing uh, devices uh, are currently available? Uh, perhaps some of you here are familiar with this uh, actually quite elegant um, device produced by Vernier. Um, in its basic configuration, it costs about $300. Uh, it's being used for education. Uh, you, you plug it onto your computer by USB, um, and then there are different sensors you can just attach to your, um, uh, to your main uh, board right here. But there's a big problem with it, is that there's all these wires. Um, and imagine you wanted to record perhaps the acceleration when uh, you know, a, a pianist plays a piano, or perhaps you want to uh, record when you play tennis, you know, how, how is the movement of your racket, how much acceleration do you have as you uh, play and hit the ball. Uh, so that would be not possible with that uh, current technology. So our vision is to um, have basically a suite of uh, 54 sensors um, interact wirelessly uh, either with your, your notebook, perhaps with your cell phone, or with your smartphone. Um, and, and you can think of, of anything you can measure. Here's, here's a list of uh, all the sensors we've come up with after extensive research. And if anybody finds another one, I'll buy him a drink or give him some cash rewards. Uh, um, so, no, actually, so the, the, our, our project is to make them wireless and also to design the sensors as we go along. Uh, so they, they do not exist at, at this time. Um, so what do we want these sensors to, to, uh, to be doing? Well, first of all, we'd like to um, have them interact with Windows CE. And the reason for that is because of the real-time capabilities of, of Windows. Uh, we'd like to develop um, the um, libraries for these sensors using uh, Visual Studio.net. Um, and then what we'd like these sensors to do is, oops, excuse me, uh, is to be able to interact with known packages, uh, such as MathCAD, which is a great tool to do um, scientific computations. Um, perhaps also with Microsoft Office, you're writing a document, you want to bring in uh, sensors. Uh, but perhaps for education purposes, it goes even further, where the CAD model uh, of the sensors is actually integrated in um, what you give to students or to researchers. So here what we're looking at, for example, uh, is a high-precision calorimeter uh, where m a muscle fiber is being put in that uh, particular chamber here. And thus you can, you can measure the uh, uh, thermodynamic balance as you contract and expand muscle. So wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, students uh, could learn actually how sensors work, how measurements are being done, uh, but also by interacting with uh, the CAD models uh, and, and various animations. Um, and, and of course, if the CAD model is available, that particular person could also make his sensors, uh, which, which is certainly a possibility. Also, it struck us um, that um, many individuals in this room and throughout the country uh, interact with many, many kinds of networks. Um, more recently, at home, uh, you may have various different networks. Uh, therefore, you could imagine um, that these sensors, in some ways, uh, could be interacting with your home network as well. Um, how, would we how, do we how would we like the, um, uh, uh, the sensors to interact wirelessly? Well, we would like them to actually uh, interact on a sort of peer-to-peer -peer, um, basis. Uh, why? Because we, we don't want to have a server running all the time such that these uh, uh, sensors can communicate. On the, on the contrary, if you have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, protocol, um, you can have these sensors, uh, first of all, self-discover themselves. Perhaps they'll exchange with the computer or with themselves their calibration parameters. They'll return them uh, a result with the right unit. Um, and, and so, therefore, um, a peer-to-peer -peer is actually quite, uh, quite desirable. If we look across uh, wireless technology, uh, what is uh, available currently for implementing such, uh, such sensors? Um, we actually selected two uh, particular protocols. The first one would be the ZigBee uh, protocol. Um, the ZigBee, what's very interesting with it is it's, it's actually extremely low power. Um, and also, it, it takes a very sm small amount of time to wake up a sensor. So unlike your Bluetooth devices, it only takes 30 milliseconds to wake up a ZigBee device. Um, the, the major drawback with ZigBee is the speed, because uh, you can only do 256 kilobits per second. So down the road, we think that wireless USB or ultra-wideband uh, would be quite desirable. 
There you can do uh, 480 megabits per second uh, in a four meter uh, range. Uh. Um, and again, also another very interesting thing with the ultra wideband uh, uh, wireless USB um, is how, uh, uh, um, how, how, how little power it actually consumes. And, and that's actually a feature that's very, very desirable. Um, furthermore, um, not only would you like to have this device to, to be wirelessly uh, connected, we'd also like them to actually do the computation on the sensor. And why is that? If you look at um, this diagram uh, here, where you look at the power consumption uh, in joules per megabyte uh, for different protocols, it turns out that it actually takes about, uh, at best, from this table, uh, it takes about a joule per megabyte uh, to, uh, to transmit uh, data. So um, if you take, for example, um, uh, so if you reduce this, this unit of one joules per megabyte, that's, that's about 10 to minus 7 um, joules per bit. Um, if you take a 30 meter by 30 meter range array, um, and let's say you take RF, uh, like with its good, good working figures, such as uh, 10 to minus 10 joules per bit per square meter, you also come down to 10 to minus 7 joules per bit. Now, if you take a modern computer, um, like most of you have in this room, this consumes about 10 to the minus 13 joules uh, per bit. And so therefore, it's actually more convenient to do the computation on board rather than communicate with uh, perhaps another sensor, perhaps with a mainframe or, or, or a computer, to, to have that computer do the computation. So it's better to do it on board, uh, again, if you're in a strategy where you want to con consume as little power uh, as possible. Oh, wrong direction. So how is this IDAT sensor uh, looking like? Um, the idea is that we'll use a processor. And by the way, these actually are not really available right now. This is going to be a, they're going to be available in a few months' time. Uh, but the, the, the first row of, of, or the first prototypes have come out already. So we'd like a 32 bit processor on the same chip to have the wireless RF, um, and then here high uh, resolution uh, bits, uh, uh, sorry, high, high resolution uh, acquisition boards. And here, all we need are you know, two leads for uh, the battery and then one lead for the SPI uh, communication. And the whole device should be less than 20 millimeters uh, in, in dimension. So here's one of the chips uh, that's uh, currently uh, in, in beta production uh, from, uh, from uh, ChipCon. Another architecture from, from Cirrus, also in, in the process of being made. Um, this one is quite interesting. It's, uh, um, produced by ST Micro in Europe, and it basically combines the wireless together with the computation. Um, throughout our research, um, we found actually that already a few sensors were available um, in the market um, that combined basically sort of system on a chip uh, type design, and which led us to, um, uh, uh, to, to think that there's, there's definitely a trend uh, in that direction uh, of sort of uh, systems on a chip type, uh, type devices. So here, is a humidity sensor. Uh, you notice the size, how small it is. Uh, and again, the price is dramatic. So 25 bucks for a little thing like that uh, is quite amazing. Uh, here's another one, a microphone uh, produced by MEMS technology, where here a membrane etched in silicon actually is your microphone. Uh, again, you can get this one for very low cost. Infrared therm uh, thermometer, uh, again, system on a chip. Um, amazing. Um, sort of uh, a A2D, D2A type um, a device you can buy from Burr Brown these days for $15. You get 24 bits, 100 kilo, sam 100 kilo sample type uh, data acquisition. Um, so our goal is really to integrate all these devices together uh, and create this new sort of, of sensors. Um, then we'll use um, the uh, um, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio.net to create the interface. And there you can imagine you can add, uh, you can add uh, all sorts of kind of uh, data analysis um, and, 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 and uh, functionality to your, to your device. Um, so now I'm going to switch gear and uh, talk about our, one of our projects, uh, another project that was to um, basically look at a tablet PC as a, as a replacement for laboratory notebooks. And we all here uh, have been using notebooks. Um, we, we know it's part of the scientific process or the process of discovery, you write down your ideas, it has to be signed, and at the end of the day, or perhaps at, at the end of a long period of research, you want to uh, perhaps write a report, write a paper, and then you need to get all these notebooks, uh, and it's a pain to actually search through them, and perhaps also you may want to um, share them with colleagues, 
Um, and again, you'll have to, to put them in a digital format. Uh, so our idea was to actually use uh, you know, a tablet PC infrastru infrastructure to, um, um, as, as a way to do laboratory notebooks and see how well this uh, would be usable in, in the field. Um, beyond all the data structures, and, and again, I'm just going to show a few of, of them that we use here, um, Many, many times, uh, when we used to use our paper-based notebook, we'll make an experiment, have, um, you know, um, print out the data, or, or put the data in Excel, print it out in a the printer, then glue it in a lab notebook. Well, why not have it actually directly uh, in digital form? Moreover, why not have the tablet PC interact directly with the instrument, record the data directly into your lab notebook, uh, such that you can uh, document your scientific work? So yeah, I'm just going to show different data uh, uh, types to work with, um, from various, let's say, molecular packages, from CAD packages, um, from software we, we've developed uh, in-house. Uh, images also play a very important role in our work, uh, in, again, in a, in a sort of the process of documentation. Uh, different data types and, and, and sort of numerical data. Um, some of them can be more noisy, some, uh, some less noisy. And so our idea was actually to use a very simple techniques with what was available at that time, uh, and just use Microsoft um, Word um, to, to import all uh, the, the documentation of our work. And why did we use Microsoft Word? Well, the reason is uh, everybody actually is using it uh, on, in the world, uh, so it makes actually sharing quite, uh, quite easily. So here's like an, an example of how uh, one lab notebook might, uh, might look like. Yeah. Um, again, you can easily interface um, the instrument together with the lab notebook. Um, so here in particular, uh, that the tablet PC would record uh, uh, potential um, and, and current from that experiment being carried here at low temperature, uh, but also record temperature as well as input a command uh, signal. Um, so another advantage of uh, lab notebooks is that um, they actually um, become searchable. So if you've done an experiment a year ago, uh, very easily you can actually search for it uh, with keywords. Um, and, 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 and decide whether or not to include that into your, your, your paper. Um, you, can e you can easily share it with email or websites. And so the limitation actually we found with these tablets were twofold. First of all, uh, it was a hardware uh, issue. Um, some of them were not fast enough uh, for some of the CAD packages we were using. So the thickness of the, uh, the notebooks was, was quite a problem. So from the and, and, and finally, uh, some people actually um, uh, had a tough time actually working um, with uh, a, a sort of a, a paper that's in a digi digital form. And so uh, from our experiments, uh, we found that probably half the people liked it and some other half actually didn't end up uh, using it after a, few, after, after a few time. And that experiment ran for about a year. So I think right now we have about half of our lab doing electronic and the other half doing old style. Um, where do we see the future of a lab notebook? Uh, we see as computing power becomes uh, more and more uh, efficient and also low cost, a great interaction with uh, our iLab project with the, the wireless sensors. Uh, also, you'd like to uh, input you know, voice commands into your, uh, your notes. Um, the support of, of um, uh, scientific um, uh, um, uh, vocabulary and... and, 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 and um, Oh, what is it called? Equations, for example, is not very well supported at this time. So that will be something very, very desirable uh, for the future. And finally, the legal aspect is also another hot topic. Uh, we found that the best way was actually to print them out again, sign them, and then we actually cover our backs uh, like that. Um, I've, I've heard recent reports from major pharmaceutical companies such as Pfizer um, that uh, they are actually implementing uh, some of these strategies and also looking into digital signatures uh, to... Um, uh, to, again, secure their, uh, their, their intellectual property. The funny thing, though, is that nobody wants to be the first one with whom a court case actually will rule against uh, documenting their, their work in, uh, uh, digitally. On my side, as a scientist, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, it's been so easy to share, actually, data in that way. Uh, for example, I had uh, one of my committee members during my PhD who was in Japan, uh, instead of writing a lengthy email about my experiments, I just sent the whole notebook, and that was actually much easier and for him also much more uh, self-explanatory. So where's the future of IDAT? Uh, so IDAT, is, we're very, very excited about IDAT. Uh, we think actually it's going to be, um, you know, 
if, if integration um, execution works well, uh, we think it actually could have a major impact uh, both uh, in the scientific community but also in, the, in education. And right now, we have a fantastic interaction between you know, Microsoft and our lab at MIT. We're looking for a partner um, on the indus industrial side uh, to carry out actually the manufacturing uh, of, this, uh, uh, of these sensors. So we're currently in talks with ST Micro, uh, one of the leading uh, microelectronics uh, manufacturer in Europe. In fact, most of your cell phones have uh, ST Micro chips uh, embedded in them. Uh, Matsushita, Intel, and, and Cisco Systems would be other uh, partners we're currently talking to. Um, and then to, to end uh, with a note, um, here, here's a matter of several of our collaborators that have agreed uh, to uh, use some of our first beta phase uh, type sensors in their applications. And uh, we're very excited that you know, so, many, so many people actually are willing to uh, dedicate some of their time to, to do that. And at this time, I'd like to open up the discussion um, and uh, take some questions. Yes? Can I just ask, you mentioned MathCAD. Do you have any interaction with MATLAB, um, particularly given that they have that old notebook to Word right, right, um, right, yeah. technology? Do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, um, we, we use MATLAB quite a lot, actually. In fact, uh, uh, we prefer to use that than Excel. I'm <laughs> sorry to, to say that. Uh, and mostly because of the large data files uh, you, you can import with it. Uh, I think the, the maximum for Excel is around 65,000 uh, data entry. And if you record, let's say, at a, a, no, a kilohertz, uh, that actually fills up uh, quite quickly. Um, I am familiar with the, um, uh, the, the notebook uh, you, um, you, you mentioned. Uh, and it's actually quite elegant and a good way to import, um, to import actually data into, into Word and then to, to share it, yes. Not yet, actually, yeah. We should include that. It's, it's, a, it's a very good point, yeah. yeah. Is there a database? Is, is are these transactions from in, uh, going in directly into the database? Or what is right, the idea would be to have it all XML-based, uh, basically, and, and again, interact with uh, Visual Studio.net uh, framework. Yeah. So the, many, many years ago, actually before MATLAB was, was invented, our lab, um, had created um, a data format that was, that was um, a way to actually uh, use, uh, a way to, to describe uh, biomedical data. Um, and that's something actually we've continued throughout the years and actually implemented in Visual Studio.net uh, more recently. Uh, we call it the, um, remember, I think it's the Plexus uh, data, uh, data format. And that data format is, is um, in a way, such that you can actually easily manipulate it and perhaps compute things like you know, the cross-correlation or probability, probability density functions and, and so on. And so um, we, we haven't set yet, I, I should say, what exactly it's going to look like, but it's certainly going to include some of these comp uh, components. So XML-based and, and some of the sort of um, Plexus-based type um, uh, data format. Um. Right. Um, how do your scientists exchange this sort of thing or only uh, successful experiments? So if you are a decent scientist, you actually should record everything. And uh, you know, if you've made a mistake, you just cross it and write why you think you've made a mistake, yes. And, it's, and, and, and I understand your question. So how do you implement that in a laboratory notebook that's electronically based and wouldn't be wouldn't you, wouldn't you be tempted, actually, to erase things that don't look so good? So what you can do, actually, is use, for example, I mean, it's a very trivial example, but you could use uh, the track changes features uh, in Microsoft Word, uh, which actually has a timestamp, which for legal reasons is wonderful. Uh, it perhaps it doesn't look so good, but at least you know exactly when things are being added and not added. And again, I think there's some security features that you can turn on and off where actually somebody cannot turn off the track changes uh, feature. Right, yeah. And 
know, it's the same kind of thing that I run a program and I start with the data set and I create something new and I, and there was a lot of thought that went into that, but the problem usually is that I, I figure that I can remember what I did because I utterly gained the file. Right, it's true. Yeah. And in fact, I can go, you know, no one else can use that to figure out what I did. And at my age, I can't remember next week what they said. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and so, one of the issues here is, is how can the computer help you create the Sort of context aware type of computing, I think, would be uh, you know, certainly a very desirable. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's actually very difficult to, to implement. In fact, there's a group at MIT in the Media Lab that does exactly that as you go on, and, and then you end up with huge amounts of data, 90% of which is, which is probably junk. Um, but then to give you a solution, what you can do now, um, we actually in the lab have a way to, to number files that's known throughout the organization, such that you know, if you did an experiment on a particular day, somebody can actually know from the way you actually uh, write the file that you know, that should be the experiment. So, so the content of the lab notebook of that day should be in that file. So there are various tricks you can play, but I agree there is no elegant solution at this time. Uh, and, and perhaps one way would be to have the, the instrument interact with your computing device and, and in doing the interaction, you know, would know, you know, what's the next thing you're about to do and, thing, and things like that. So sort of a, predict, predicti, a predictive and, uh, and so context-aware type, type computing. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, pull those for the break and, and edit at the end. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.